it's April. April comes from the Roman Aprilis and that means to open. Everything's opening up and the flowers for April are the sweet pea and the daisy. The humble little daisy. Well known for helping with bumps and bruises um, and helping break OCD type patterns. So the gemstone this month is the diamond and April was the month where the Romans would celebrate the goddess Venus. The full moon in this lovely month of April is known as the budding moon or also the new shoots moon. It's also sometimes called the paschal moon and it's really important this moon because so much in April um, depends on it. So where the position of Easter Sunday lies is all dependent on the full moon. So the Easter Sunday is worked out because it moves every year by it being the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. And that's the same for the Passover as well. It's worked out by the moon. And the new moon is also important in April for working out where Ramadan starts. So lots to do with the moon. And this moon this month is a super moon and we're gonna go out on a moonlight meander to go and look at it. also known as the budding moon, the new shoots moon, or the paschal moon. It's really giant and red. Got bats flying above our head while we're looking at it. April is the first sign of the zodiac, Aries. And um, in terms of the zodiac calendar, it's the first month and you can see why they chose this month to be the beginning of the year because the weather has just taken a much better turn for the warmer uh, and higher barometer pressures and everything's opening up, everything's coming to life. It really does feel like it is the start of the year. stumbled upon this patch of um, Lunaria which is also known as Honesty. It's the plant that in the autumn gives you those gorgeous golden shimmering pennies um, and you can split them open as kids and find all the seeds. So it really is dazzling in the uh, wayside. No particular herbal use for it other than just to cheer your spirits up. If there's anything that could um, symbolise that opening up kind of feel of April, it's the bracken. So it unfills at the bottom of the hedgerows, gradually becomes more ferny until it reaches really high heights. There's cleavers absolutely everywhere at the minute. You can just bite the tops off them and eat the young shoots. Look for insects first though. But um, the best thing to do with these is to infuse them in cold water overnight and then drink it as a nice refreshing cold drink the following day. And what cleavers does, clears all your lymphatic system out. Helps you get rid of all your toxins, all your excess salts, all your excess waste that would normally take a little longer to come out. It's what we knew we called sticky weed as kids. We would throw at each other, and in the uh, when it starts to get its buds, its little seeds, those seeds can actually be dried and ground up and used as a coffee type drink. Never done it. Seems a bit fiddly to me, but I'd be interested to try it at some point. 
So in April, the temperatures have risen beautifully. It's been really lovely lately. I've got a coat on today because it's quite windy, but we've had about two or three weeks of sun and the skies, if you can see, are just this glorious blue. Still in full swing. Little one here is nibbling on some. When the sun is on the gorse, it smells so gorgeous. Apparently, if you bottle it up in some vodka, you can actually kind of capture that coconut smell and have it as a, an aperitif. At the minute, the animals are either well into their courtship, looking after each other and busily breeding their offspring and making their nests, but some are still trying to attract each other's attention. So um, I have just noticed swallows zooming about. I'll try and capture those in a moment when they come back. When we were children, April was always known for its April showers where these huge cumulonimbus clouds would come over all of a sudden and give us a jolly old soaking. These days, over the past sort of 10 years, April's really been quite glorious. Um, and actually, I think, has been one of the better months of the year. It's probably down to global warning, warming. T.S. Eliot once referred to April as the cruelest month. Um, and there's an old saying, sweet April showers do bring May flowers. <laughs> But actually, other than uh, maybe a couple of hours, we've had no rain this April so far. It's been beautiful. Everybody notices the holly in the winter with its bright red blossom. But if you take a look at it this month and next month, you'll see the little buds coming out that will blossom into a little white flower and produce those lovely red berries. So take a moment to give lovely holly a little bit of attention while she's preparing all those beautiful red berries that we'll all enjoy in the winter. And holly berries are very, very poisonous indeed, but actually the flowers are used as herbal and homeopathic um, remedies and I believe bark flower remedies as well. Some plants, certain parts are very poisonous and others aren't. That's why you must always be careful and know what you're doing. just about to cut through this hedgerow and go along here to a favourite place of ours to come on the summer solstice where we can climb to the top of this hill where a little one already is way ahead of me and watch the sunset on the 21st of June. We're going to lay a blanket down in this field in a minute and have a drink out of our flask. Little one started to enjoy coffee. I only let her have decaf. So we're going to open our flask up and have a little cup of coffee and look out for swallows zooming along this field. It's very windy because we're quite high up here but hopefully we should see some skylarks and some swallows. So our four-legged friends this month, the badger who's had her babies a long time ago, remember? The little badger cubs will be venturing out in the immediate vicinity of the sets now. And um, the fox cubs, they too will be wrestling and cavorting in the meadows just near where their dens are. And because they're a little bit more independent, it lets the vixen have some time to go off and forage for herself now in the morning and the evening. So do you remember last month, she was relying on the dog fox sometimes he could be a bit lazy and forget to come back and she'd have to bark at him. Well, um, this month she gets to go and uh, get her own food. And the dog fox becomes very protective over the cubs at this time and he will guard them fiercely around the area of the set. Watch out too as well if you live particularly in the south or areas where it's known that adders are. The adders are coming out of hibernation and they will go out and warm themselves up as they come out of hibernation for such a long time they need to act like solar panels and soak the sun up so be careful don't step on any although actually when you look into it the amount of people that have ever actually died from stepping on an adder 
it's really really low over time but it, it would hurt and cause a nasty a nasty problem that you'd have to get sorted out Whilst we're on the subject of adders, the night sky at the minute, if you look up, there's a really great constellation called Hydra. And Hydra is a snake. And the story goes that the sun god Apollo sent his crow out to get him a cup of water. And the crow must have been cheeky, like you. And uh, <laughs> the crow brought back this cup of water with a snake in it and passed it to Apollo. And Apollo was furious. And he threw the cup with the crow and the snake up into the sky and the crow and the snake became constellations. And right now up in the sky in April, if you look, you'll also see Venus shining very brightly at the minute up in the sky. Um, uh, up in the sky right up there is Hydra, the snake. Oh my word, this tree is laden with apple blossom all the way oh my goodness that must be about 30 feet up there little ones just feasting on apple blossom broads it's quite a strong perfumey flavor isn't it mm -hmm. i like them best when they're in bud and you get this lovely dark pink on the outer leaves Queen Bee is now out of the nest herself and she is um, busily feeding herself and doing what she does and the young larvae they still need to be kept warm at night so they have these nurse bees whose job it is to keep them warm in the hive because even though it's been glorious in the day the nighttime temperatures are still coming down very very low we've still had our fire on and you'll be able to spot the difference when you see a bee uh, a big bumblebee. If you see one resting and sunbathing, that's the male. I'm not making any comments there whatsoever, <laughs> but the male bumblebee is known for being a little bit um, more uh, free and easy, let's say. He likes to have a sunbathe and have a rest where the female will, will seldom rest. She'll just keep on whizzing about. And actually, we all know about honeybees and bumblebees, but the solitary bees, like the red mining bee, they actually work so much harder than a bumblebee. A red mason bee is an example of a solitary bee. That means that they will make their own little nests, uh, usually mining little holes in clay soils and riverbanks. And one red mining bee works as hard as 120 uh, honeybees. So next time you see a little solitary bee, you'll have to give it a very um, imaginative pat on the back. Dave was this wasp that would come into our house every day at exactly the same time and he'd got this little root where he knew where our cordial bottle was stored and he used to whiz along, go and sit on the cordial bottle for a few minutes, get a little bit of sugar off the lid and then whiz back out and uh, everything was fine until he bought a friend one day and it was like having an uninvited guest at a party so we had to start shutting the door and telling Dave not to come back. Tip. So this is the garlic mustard that the orange tip is so fond of. It's also really tasty. Mm. Cuckoo comes in April. She sings her song in May. In the middle of June she changes her tune and in July she flies away. Haven't heard any cuckoos yet but now's the time to listen out for them. For the past couple of years, I've actually seen one twice um, flying over, over our house. They must be around our house somewhere. And they actually look surprisingly quite like a sparrow hawk from underneath when you see them, the pattern on their bellies. So the cuckoo comes from Africa 
and she's really clever. We all know that she likes to um, go and lay her egg in another bird's nest so that the other bird will look after her young and she doesn't have to. But she will lay between 11 and 25 eggs. So it's not just one little bird's nest that she's doing this to. She's hopping around several, laying her eggs. And the fascinating thing about the eggs is, is that whichever bird she chooses, whether it's a dunnock, or um, some other kind of very small bird, her egg will be made the same colour as the host bird's nest and, and its brood are, so that the host bird is, is not suspicious. Um, so that is just mind boggling to me that she can program her egg to be the colour of the bird, the natural colour of the bird's egg that she's going to put her egg in their nest. That's like, mind is blown with that one. July she will fly back to Africa where she came from but she won't fly back until her final egg has hatched so I'm not sure about that whether she keeps a little close eye on all her nests and goes around patrolling making sure they've all hatched or what or if she has a sixth sense but apparently she won't fly back to Africa until every single one of her eggs has hatched. Just found one of many little patches of bluebells on our walk and the first bluebells will come out in uh, April and after a recent poll it was found that bluebells were Britain's favourite flower and more than half of the world's bluebells are actually in Britain so there's loads of bluebell woods you can find out where they are on on the internet um, maybe visit them if you can earmark a, a one near you to go and have a look at such a beautiful feast for the eyes and you'll find more bluebells where the canopies are the densest because the shade makes them grow and become more prolific. And if you find a very, very heavy patch of bluebells in woodland, it's a sign that it's an ancient woodland and dates back to at least the 1600s. All these baby pine cones grow in here, Bella. Listen carefully to the clicking sound if you can hear it. All the pine cones are popping open in the sun. Sounds like snap, crackle and pop. All right, so these are called hawthorn buds. Um, they're known as bread and cheese. You put the hawthorn leaves when they're only just growing um, together and then put a bud in the middle and it's meant to be like cheese, although it tastes like nuts completely. Um, so if you see one, and um, when you're on your walks, just try it because it actually tastes really nice and it's satisfying. <laughs> it is. So I'm just walking along, I can hear the skylarks all around me in this field. And this is kind of the perfect environment for a skylark to, to nest in, although they tend to prefer more of a meadow grass. This is like the remnants of last year's straw that's still poking up, that's not been reset this field yet. Um, but if you just listen carefully, I don't know if you can hear that, the gorgeous skylarks, which unfortunately are in decline due to the way that the farms are sowing their fields at different times of the year now. It's not providing the right environment at the right time of year for them to nest. Just turn my camera around just to show you. I've just caught a little one munching on a dandelion. <laughs> So dandelions are absolutely everywhere at the moment and I love them. I love to see the bees around them and uh, I love the fact that they're so good for your digestion and for your liver. And there's lots of things you can do with the dandelions. You can eat the leaves in salads, um, although they are quite bitter, so you want a good dressing to go on with them and soften it. Um, and if you find a really good root, you can get that chopped up and roasted and all sorts of things you can do with dandelion root. But they're often included in digestive bitters, dandelion, because they're so stimulating for your um, digestive juices. People who get a lot of reflux really benefit from taking digestive bitters before a meal so um, or indigestion or heartburn because it's a common misconception actually 
that you get these symptoms because you have too much stomach acid. Well, if you actually test most of the people that think they've got too much stomach acid, what's actually happening is, is they don't have enough. And then they get put in this awful cycle of being put on proton pump inhibitors or PPIs, you know, the antacid type medications, which just inhibits the small amount that they've got already. So when you're not producing enough stomach acid, something called hypochloridia, you just can't digest the food into a state that's acceptable for it to go down into the intestines and so you're left with this heaviness and this reflux happening in your stomach because your stomach just can't pass it on properly down to the tubes below and then once it does go into the tubes below it's in the un un indi undigested state creates all sorts of gas and bloating and problems like that so there's all sorts of things you can do if that sounds familiar to you and you don't want to go along the uh, PPI route which I'd suggest you try and avoid at all costs for very many reasons um, and one is digestive bitters and digestive bitters have, have a profound effect on so many people suffering from reflux, reflux and um, indigestion just take them in some water before um, you have your meal and you can look those up. There's something called Napier's um, bitters. There's all sorts of Swedish bitters. But if you just type up, type in um, whichever search engine you choose, digestive bitters, it might be something that can help you. But nine times out of 10, they've got dandelion in. <laughs> Bella. So I'm just looking on some um, dead nettles. You can also call them archangels, but I prefer to call them dead nettles, by the way. Um, they are part of the mint family um, and actually are not related to the nettles at all. So what and do you do? What you do is you pull off a white flower yeah. and then you go to the bottom of it, suck it, and it should taste really sweet like pollen. But some might not have enough cause of, of pollen for you to suck because the bees have already had it. Yeah, if the bees have beat you to it, they've had the, the nectar, it's the nectar you're tasting, not the pollen. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, it's just really, really nice. There's a little bee down here somewhere enjoying some. There's plenty here though for everybody. Mm-hmm. And it's a lovely treat. So, the little ends where they join onto the plant, if you just suck them. Oh, that is incredibly sweet full of nectar and there's enough here in this patch for us and the bees but these are actually really beneficial as well you can make a really fragrant and delicate tea with these a bit like honeysuckle tea you just steep them in some boiling water for a few minutes and then strain it off and drink it drink it so this um is not just a tasty little treat that you can make a really nice delicate tea out of or or just suck as you're going along it's actually really good for female um leukaria issues and just general menstrual health any menstrual problems can make a nice tea or use it dried to help with that sort of thing so you could look it up there hi bella you can look it up and look up for um the benefits of archangel or dead nettle pretty aren't they yeah some everywhere we look at the minute this looks glorious against that blue sky. We're just walking through this huge field and I'm not sure what this was the remnants of. Perhaps sugar beet. I don't, I don't know, I'm guessing. But um, there's usually sheep in this field and every single one of these old stalks has got a lump of sheep wool on it. So we're just gathering a load up because um, we're going to take it home and put it out in the garden and then... This will be lovely for the birds to line their nests with. Um, so this is something my mum does every year, brings a bit of sheep wool back out of the countryside and she watches the birds taking it. It's nice and soft, keep them warm, keep the little chicks cozy. So we're gonna go and gather a lot more of this off of these stumps. We're just in Blidworth churchyard. Again, one of my favorite places to be and it is just an array of primroses everywhere intermingled with these glorious forget-me-nots now primrose are 
an endangered species so don't ever be tempted to uproot any while you're out and about but they're also very good for lots of things as usual I'm interested in them because of their benefits for the female reproductive organs um, but what little one's doing over there is munching on them because still with the headphones on because they have a really nectar filled base so I've just nipped off the whole thing here now normally if this was just one primrose on a path I wouldn't go near it but there is absolutely enough for everybody here so here we are and I've got the whole bit at the bottom of it too mm, that is actually really nice isn't it I've not tried these before because well oh it's like honey gosh that that is just gorgeous I'm gonna get another one we're just sitting amongst these beautiful primroses um, so I thought I'd expand on a little bit about what else they're good for so cool pepper cool pepper sorry um, he's a really famous really old long time ago herbalist he will talks about how um, you can make a salve out of primroses and that it will heal any kind of wound but also they were known for curing the frenzy so that would be like an anxious anxiety kind of state so they're well known for being good for nervous system disorders um, and insomnia anything that you need like a calming effect for so also headaches um, and just general a pick-me-up really a pick-me-up for when your nervous disposition is in need of a little help don't get this confused with yes Bella don't get this confused with evening primrose it is a totally different plant it's not any kind of relation to this one at all so mm. next time you see some primroses if there's plenty remember it is endangered and um, you shouldn't take any if it's just sort of a solitary plant but honestly I, this is just far reaching across the whole graveyard here I'll show you some of the other flowers here in a minute it's just beautiful the, the bluebells are coming up and there's forget-me-nots everywhere but um, if there are plenty then do have a nibble mm, really is nice I bet these would be a really nice tea can tell that she's um, bored so the pussy willow here has opened up and it releases all this lovely furry kind of pollen encrusted little tufts and this tree you probably can't see but it's absolutely heaving with lots of winged insects flying about gathering all the pollen Willow is an excellent source really before all the spring flowers come out for the early bees. And then underneath, the first bluebells of the year. Well, bluebells are supposed to come out usually around St. George's Day on the 23rd, but they're just beginning to unfurl in places. I imagine there'll be a lot more popping up along this graveyard. But at the moment, we've just got the odd little clump here and there. I think there should be bus trips to this graveyard. It, it is the most beautiful graveyard I have ever seen. So over here we have just got masses and masses and masses of forget-me-nots at the minute. And there's a story about forget-me-nots, how it got its name. And that was that uh, a beautiful maiden was being walked along a, a riverside by a knight in shining armour. And he fell in for some reason or other and the armour weighed him down and as he was sinking underneath the water he reached out and passed to one of these and said forget me not so it's not a very happy story and it's not going to be true either but there we go all the bees on here lovely so this graveyard's also famous for having the the grave of Will Scarlet in it. Really is lovely. This 
this tree is enormous. We saw it right from down along the fields that we've just walked through. It's in our favourite place, the graveyard. This must just be so old, this tree, to get so big. I can't do the month of April without speaking about one of my favourite herbs and favourite plants of all time, and that's the nettle, Urtica dioica. It's the best time of the year to pick your young nettle shoots to make your recipes with nettles, whether it's pestos or soups or whether you're drying them for your teas or uh, it's just it's just the best time to get them early April preferably and um, the longer you leave it towards the end of April the more coarse and hairy the top tips go so I have done a video which you can find um, on my channel all about nettle soup and it tells you a little bit about nettles on there these ones are pretty big now but um, the top the thing with nettles is if you if you touch them with intention, they won't sting you. So you really want to take about that much as your spring tips. Um, and nettles are amazing as a blood tonic if you're low on iron. Um, maybe you have just given birth, it would be a great thing to have um, as a pick-me-up. Or if you have heavy menstruation or a lot of nosebleeds or you just struggle in general with um, your your iron levels nettle would be a really beneficial thing for you to use and explore it's quite a pleasant tea it does taste quite earthy um, it's full of so many essential minerals it's got uh, potassium phosphate magnesium calcium iron B vitamins vitamin K oh the list is endless in fact herbalists will often say if in doubt use nettles and if I'm being particularly good I try to have a cup of it each day I do add a little bit of local honey to it to sweeten it slightly um, along with anything else I add to it but nettles are amazing you need to get them into your lives so interesting facts about nettles are in the past people have um, hit themselves with them to, to sting themselves on um, spots where they have rheumatic pain, so their joints. Um, I'm not sure whether that would work or not, but it sounds a bit painful to me. And Roman soldiers um, and probably other soldiers from other countries, they would hit themselves with them or rub themselves with them when they were cold because of that immediate burning, warming sensation you get. Um, there's all sorts of strange things that have been done with nettles in the past, but um, they're very strong and the root system can actually be used um, as, a, as a twine if you take it out and dry it. And I'm, I'm pretty sure I read somewhere it was used to make some kind of uniform for some kind of troop somewhere or other once upon a time. So um, if you cook nettles, then as soon as they go into the boiling water or the stew or soup or whatever you're putting them in, the sting is not stingy anymore. It completely loses its sting. Um, and if you dry them too, the drying process will remove the sting from them. So if you do want to dry them, just lay them out um, so that they don't overlap and just leave them somewhere dry and like a shed or somewhere in a sunny window for a day or two and they do dry up pretty quick. So go and get some nettles. I'm just sat here around the back of my pond on the bank because I've got a whole load of dandelions and we were talking about these earlier. And the name, actually, dandelion, is actually from the French, don de lion. Don meaning teeth, day, of, and lion, lion. So um, the reason that is, is because if you look at the leaf, they do look like serrated teeth. So it's supposed to be the teeth of the lion. So this one's full of little beetles. I keep seeing my chickens going around actually pecking all the little beetles out of them. They're very clever, my chickens. But dandelions, like any plant, were originally believed to be ruled by a certain planet. And um, with the dandelion, it was it's thought to be very special indeed because it's ruled by the sun, 
and it's also ruled by the moon and it also is ruled by the stars. This one's not quite ready to blow. Ah, got a few coming off. But yeah, the sun, the moon and the stars. I don't deny it. A lot of people will actually pull these up in the garden and I don't know why. I know they can take over a little bit, but they're actually really good for sorting your soil out. So if your soil is very compacted, the dandelion will make a very thick and very long root. So it actually is doing a favour in the long run. Um, I know they take over flower beds, but they're so valuable for the bees and the insects. Um, and they, I think they look really cheerful. I think dandelions look really nice when they're interspersed among other kind of like wildflowers. They're really cheerful and they're very resilient and adaptable too. So apparently if you um, have got a garden where you trim your grass very regularly, the dandelion will know and instead of making its stem really long, it will keep it really low to the earth so that it flowers before you get your mower out again. Whereas if you live, if you've got dandelions growing somewhere like this, where they are going to compete against longer types of flowers, they will grow tall to get up higher above to be able to, to reach the pollinators. So it's quite clever really, that actually, whereas a normal flower has kind of a regular length stem, the dandelion knows whether it needs to put that extra power into growing taller or if it has to quickly get its flower out before the mower comes again. They also do a similar thing with their roots. If they're in very compacted soil, they will make their roots extra big and thick and strong. And they're very good at breaking up soil actually. Um, whereas if it's a very soft soil, it doesn't put quite as much effort into it. So the dandelion, most adaptable, can be found in all sorts of conditions. Clay, meadows, pavements, it just gets in there with its little seeds, it germinates very quickly as a plant. The seeds don't take long at all to go from that to that. And a real friend to the bees Buddy's not happy because I'm sat in her favourite chair in my little herb shed. It's a very sunny spot <laughs> at this time of day and I'm sat in here. That's pretty much it now for April from me and Evangeline and from Bella. Um, things you can be doing for the rest of this month is get your potatoes in the ground if you're going to be planting potatoes and uh, plant some seeds seeds are optimism it's knowing that you are planting something bright and cheerful for the future hey leave my dandelion alone cheeky um <laughs> you little monster um so get your seeds in the garden plant some beans maybe and then get them out in may and uh, nasturtiums that's a great one to plant they thrive in pretty much any condition you don't have to look after them too much and they'll bring a lot of color to your garden sweet peas if you love fragrant flowers i've got some of those on the go and i've got loads of little hey seedlings <laughs> i've got loads of seedlings for my new herb garden as well which hopefully i'll be able to show you next month so the reason i have this dandelion that this little one is desperate to get our hands on um, is this is the message for this month so last month we were being hares and we were standing up for ourselves like the female hare and this month we are going to be adaptable like the dandelion so if you need to grow your shoot really long to get out above all the mess and all the long grass and all the forget-me-nots then do it do whatever it takes for you to be adapting to the situation that you're in at the minute that makes you feel better about life um, if that means shrinking away and keeping your stem very small and close to the ground hunkering down then do it keep yourself 
happy, optimistic and positive in whatever way you can, like the dandelion. All right, see you in May. Bye.